Hey everybody, this is Jerry Deere coming to you from the Whip Artistry Studio in Jamestown, Ohio. And I've been asked to talk a little bit about some of the whips in our collection here. Now, personally, I own about 60 whips. I kind of lost track. So if you're like I am and you've got some favorites, um, sometimes the other ones sort of get stuck in the bag and they don't come out that often. But here in the studio, we use just about everything that we have. But I do have a few pieces that don't come out very often. And I wanted to show you some of those today for the Bullwhip Museum. So I'm going to start with my favorite and probably the most asked about piece from my collection. Now, when you think of the word Zorro, the first thing that comes to mind typically is either Antonio Banderas or Douglas Fairbanks. And what happened in 1998 with the Mask of Zorro generated a new interest in Zorro and a new interest in whip work, just as Indiana Jones did. So one of the things I want to show you is a whip that was used in the film that not a lot of people know about. The first thing is, this is a duplicate, and it's a, a copy or replica, of the whip that was used by uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins in the movie. And most people are used to seeing this one. It's got the silver band on it. It's got the heavy, uh, heavy knot. This was Alex Green's design he used for many years. And it's actually one of those whips that people like to, to play with it because it's such a unique piece. It has a really long handle. Um, it's a 12 plat kangaroo whip. You've probably seen this many, many times. But this isn't the whip I'm talking about from Zorro. Um, that whip, there were a couple of them, different ones. I don't have the originals to that. What I do have is sort of a stunt whip. And I guess that's the best way to explain it. So this is a six foot David Morgan whip uh, that was owned by Alex Green originally. And in the Mask of Zorro movie, they were about to shoot the mine scenes at the end and they realized that uh, there was no whip for a particular stunt that needed to be done. So in order to get that shot, they had to come up with another whip. And Alex had a brown six foot 12 plat, um, basically an indie style whip. It has the, the shorter handle here, but no wrist loop. So it's got, it's got a flat butt on it. It's a 12 plat, typical Indiana Jones style whip. There's nothing special about it. It's got the herringbone and uh, the regular braids and it's, just an ordinary whip. There was nothing really unusual, except the fact that it was brown. And as you know, you can't have a brown whip with Zorro. Zorro needs to have a black whip. It's even in one of the titles of one of the movies, Zorro's Black Whip, that's how it works. So uh, they dyed it because Antonio Banderas used the whip. It was well broken in, it was Alex's. It didn't belong to the studio. And if you don't know who Alex Green is, go look him up, he's a good friend of a lot of us in the whip world, he was a, a good friend of mine, and miss him a lot. He passed away about 10 years ago now, but the things that he taught me about whip work and, and how this whip was chosen was really kind of fun because Antonio liked this whip so well, they did dye it black and use it for the scene. It just kind of worked. So I'm gonna show you some of the detail on the whip that's sort of unique to it, but I wanna start out with um, the fall and the popper because this is kind of one of the most unusual pieces of this. Um, this whip is a two-bellied, uh, double-bellied um, indie style whip, as I mentioned, 12 plat. So it's pretty normal if you know anything about whips at all. But what's unusual is the way this popper is tied on. So I'm gonna grab this piece of cardboard over here and we're gonna try to zoom in on this for you a little bit. So if you look really closely here, I'm gonna bring two different falls and poppers. So this, the one on your left is the replica Zorro whip. And you can see I've got a knot, an ordinary fall knot tied in this. And there are a couple of ways to tie a popper on. You, you know how that works. Um, but what's interesting about this is that this is how we typically tie a popper on. But Alex didn't do it that way. Let me show you this one. So this is gonna be very hard to see, but we're gonna try to put in some, some close-ups of this. But this is a tiny little fall. I don't think it's more than, oh gosh, maybe a little over a quarter of an inch wide. And at the very bottom down here, at, at where it ends, you have the knot, but the way this is done, there's a tiny little hole in the end of this fall, and the popper is fished through that hole and pulled through. It's really kind of interesting. It's, I've not ever changed the popper on this whip. This is the popper that it came to me with. And when Alex gave me the whip, it, it had this already on it and I don't use this whip. It stays in a display case most of the time or it goes to charity events. This is an unusual piece because 
Most of the time, the fall knot is something that's tied around the whip, I'm sorry, around the popper, or the popper's tied around the fall. Most people know how to put a fall on. This is an unusual piece. Now, I'm gonna get rid of this. Let's go back to more of the body of the whip. Um, this fall is a typical white hide fall that's been dyed black, so there's nothing unusual about that. I think you can see that pretty well. It's got the typical hitch knot uh, at the bottom or the hitch to, to hold the fall on, and you can see it's got a little bit of conditioner coming through there where it's, it doesn't get used much, and I don't wipe it that often, so you can see it there. But um, the other thing is, and this is gonna be harder to see too, but if you look at the butt of the handle, you can see some of the brown. When they, they dyed this by hand, so some of the brown has worn out, the black has worn out, and the brown has worn through, so you can see little pieces of it in there. But if it were laying in a pile with other whips, you, unless you knew some other details, which I'm not gonna go into, um, there are other details about the whip that make it unique uh, that really would identify it from a different one, but we have all those recorded. So for a museum piece, that's why we take so many measurements and so much care with this. Um, but the whip, it, it's just a beautiful, crack of this whip. And if you wanna see it being used, you can go to YouTube. And um, I've had this whip on television myself. I used it with Steve Harvey on his show back in 2005. And then later in 2008 with Bonnie Hunt um, on her talk show, she actually used the whip and Steve Harvey used the whip. So a couple of celebrities have used it, but I'm gonna back up a second. So just before I got this from Alex, um, it was used for another very special movie, which some of you like and some of you don't. It was the Catwoman movie featuring Halle Berry, but it wasn't used in the film. This was actually Halle's training whip. So when they were trying to get the, the Catwoman whips finished, they weren't ready in time to get going with the training. And Alex already had this one, so it is as close to the, to the Halle Berry whips as you're gonna find. The difference between those is that it doesn't have this knot and the herringbone goes all the way down. Instead of having the checkerboard on the handles like most Indiana Jones whips, it actually has the herring that goes all the way to the knot. So that's really the only difference between this and a, and a Halle Berry um, a Catwoman whip. But it was close enough that she could learn on it. So she taught, uh, I'm sorry, Alex taught her for the movie on this uh, particular whip. Now later on, he also used it on a TV show called Peacemakers. So it was, uh, it was a USA, uh, sort of a CSI meets Gunsmoke kind of thing. If you watch Longmire, it's sort of laid out like that a little bit, um, but it was in one episode of that. And then it, it came to me um, right after uh, Halle Berry was finished with it. So it, it is in our permanent collection here and it stays uh, in a display case. Um, and I do take it to charity events and other things and I will take it out and crack it once in a while, but we're very careful with it. It's, it's one of those pieces that has a lot of history and I am really fond of Zorro, it's how I started. So when uh, Alex asked me to, to take care of this one, that was, that was kind of a big deal to me that, that he thought I should have it. So it, it worked out for us very well. Um, so now it stays as part of our collection and it sits alongside my, my replica of this one. Um, I do know that the original to this, uh, the Silver Banded Whip was um, sold not too long ago. I believe uh, Paul Nolan, Midwest Whips had it and he sold it to a collector. But this one isn't going anywhere, so it'll still be here. And um, we're gonna come back in just a second. I'm gonna show you a couple more from our collection, so don't go away. Hey, we're back. This is Jerry Deere at the Whip Artistry Studio. And our second piece that we're gonna show you in this video here is uh, one of my personal pieces that I use for performance. And it was, the, it was made by Paul Nolan at Midwest Whips, and it was, custom built for me. I asked for a very specific whip and Paul really came through for me. This whip is about 10 years old now. Um, it is a white kangaroo hide. This is not painted. A lot of people see this whip. It's about five and a half feet long and it's a single belly, um, 12 plat whip. And if you can see there, it's got black and blue knots because that is our studio colors. The Whip Artistry Studio colors are black and blue, so you see the, the checkerboard black and blue um, knots. And then it's herringbone all the way up the handle. It is not a checkerboard handle and goes all the way up to the, to the Spanish knot at the top. So this piece right here, also black and blue, and then it continues on, but it's hard to really show it, but this starts tapering down here at the base at the end of the fall, I'm sorry, end of the, the thong, 
And at the end of that handle, it is continually narrowing all the way down. This is something I asked for um, because it just, they work better that way. This is my, this is how I feel about it. But you can sort of see that it gets narrower all along this length, all the way up to the ball of the, the uh, Spanish knot, and then around the rest of the whip. But a couple of interesting parts about this whip, but apart from the fact that it's white and not painted, which most people do, is I use a, a multicolor popper on it just to add to it. Now I should say, also this whip doesn't get used very often because of its white leather, um, if you use this on a regular basis, you would destroy it. It just couldn't handle it. And one of the reasons I wanted a white whip was because my very first whip was white. I was about five or six years old and it's actually in one of the cases behind me here in the studio museum area. But it's, it just had that piece, that look that I liked. Plus when you're working on stages all the time, you want those white whips. When people see this from a distance, they think it's nylon and it isn't. This is kangaroo hide um, and Paul Nolan can tell you how he accomplished all of this. I'm not gonna get into those details with you here, but just know this is one of the best, most accurate whips I've ever used. And I used it in a show called Whips and Wands for many years with a magician, and it was hanging on a tuxedo. But now someone would say, well, Jerry, that's a really nice whip. How did you keep it so clean? Uh, well, that's because it doesn't get used very much. It has a stunt double. So I'm gonna introduce you to this whip's stunt double right now. So along with this whip, I asked Paul to make me one that was a little more durable, that we could paint to look like that one. And this is what we came up with. It's roughly the same length, but this whip is has a similar taper from the handle, uh, the, the handle butt all the way out. It's got a similar taper to the other one, but it's an eight plat single belly whip. And it's eight plat because the eight plat whip can take a lot more abuse than a 12 plat. The finer those strands are, the less they can handle, especially if you're outside doing shows. And one of the first performances this got used in was a rodeo. So I was out in dirt, muck, it was pretty terrible. But we painted just from the handle, from this Spanish knot all the way out, we painted the whip with craft paint, uh, it's designed for leather. And that way the whip showed up the way the white leather would have, but I wanted to keep the functionality. People would say, well, why don't you just use a nylon whip in place of that? Even the nylon whips get dirty. So this is one of those pieces that we really wanted to pay attention to how it was built. Um, and the black, um, people say, why did you dye the, the knot black here? Well, the knot, uh, the Spanish knot is dyed black so that you can see an easy transition on film and from a distance from an audience, you can see a real easy transition where that whip starts. I don't care where they see the handle. So the brown, the whip was originally brown, just like this handle is. Um, and you can see also there's a piece of leather missing at the butt, came off years and years ago, and I don't wanna put it back. I just kinda of like the, the end of the nail. If you know how these are made, there's a, there's a steel spike in there and that, that's the head of the nail sticking out. But these two whips have really served me well over the years. Um, they're tapers, the interior construction. It proved to me that I don't really see a whole lot of difference between an eight and a 12 as far as functionality goes, but this whip has held up a lot better um, from just being used, as you can see, it, now it may be difficult to see on camera, but the leather is in incredibly good condition. And this whip gets used a lot. I mean, I, this is my go-to for shows, for, for any kind of performance, and any kind of weather, really. I don't really pull the punches. I don't like nylon whips, so the paracord whips don't do like I, I want them to do a lot of times, so I have some, but this is my go-to. Um, the other thing is the popper tie. And this is not anything too fancy, but these are right. These are both white hide falls. Uh, I'll just, I can show you that. That's not really anything to write home about. Those are normal. But uh, the popper here, I will always use a light colored popper, typically white. Um, and then you've got this, the fall knot, I'm sorry, the popper is tied around the end of the fall instead of the fall being tied around the popper because it just keeps that streamlined flow. You don't have that big clunky knot at the end of that. And I have the same, same thing here with the, uh, the white one. It's very much the same kind of a situation there. So um, the poppers that I use are, are basically upholstery thread. Uh, they need to be really loud and very, very precise. So I don't, I don't really use the, the baling twine type or the poly type on whips like this. Um, also, it, they're a little too heavy. Oh, that, I should point that out too. 
So this fall on the stunt whip, here's the stunt whip again, this fall is much heavier. So if you look at the thickness coming off of the, the hitch here, for the fall hitches, this one is markedly thicker than this one. It's a much heavier fall. And as it goes down, this becomes very, very thin here. You can see how tiny that is compared to the, the heavier one on the stunt whip because the stunt whip, again, has to take a lot of abuse. It's gonna be out in the weather. It's gonna be out wherever I am working. This is probably the whip I do the most targets with and it, it takes a lot of abuse. So I wanna make sure that the fall is heavy enough. Now, neither of these whips have ever had the faults changed and that's because partly the way I take care of them but also it's a, a testimony to, to the white hide. I think that this particular batch of white hide we had um, that Paul made these out of was just particularly good. So uh, I haven't had to do a lot with it. You can see that there, if you look at it closely, which you may not be able to see from the camera angle, but it, it's pretty beat up. I mean, it gets used a lot. So it's, it's not perfect by any stretch, but it's well kept uh, and well taken care of. Also, I should point out the handle length on these is about 10 inches. So you have, you know, it's not an Indiana Jones whip. It's more like a, uh, an Australian bull whip. So it has the longer longer handle and that goes to its precision. As What I told Paul when I sort of designed these things in my head was I wanted it to be super precise. I'm taking numbers off of playing cards with these. So whoever my, my target holder is, I wanna make sure that that is always a safe thing to do that I have two or three inches of, of dead space where I can be that precise and be one way or the other and not even be close to hurting that person. So it's really important that this work very well, that these transitions hold up. Now I should point out also that these whips would not be very good for multiple cracking, for um, things like uh, volleys and other types of, of motion where the whip has to oscillate in some way back and forth. If you were having to do this with it, this transition is in really, really good condition because I don't do that with these whips. Because of the single belly, and Paul does amazing work, don't get me wrong, it has nothing to do with the whip makers at all, but if this was worn like that, this would break down much, much faster. So everybody talks about David Morgan's whips, and maybe on a subsequent, you can have a look at any David Morgan whip, a lot of them are broken down right through here, even the Indiana Jones whips from the films, because they just didn't bulk this up very well. Paul does a particularly good job on the inside of these, and a lot of a lot of whip makers do too, but if they weren't, uh, it would break down in a hurry. And even if, no matter how good you are, even if you were that good at it and you made a great transition, this is gonna break down because there's a single belly in there, it's very narrow, it's not built to take that kind of punishment. So that's the reason they're in such good condition after 10 years or so. So they, uh, they are a unique pair because this is my idea of a paired match uh, of whips because it's, really one doing one job to protect the other. So I can still use this nice white one indoors on carpeted stages and other areas where, it, where it's a nice space. And I've got a duplicate of it to work out in the, uh, out in the weather and everything. So that's our two uh, or rather three whips we wanted to show you today from the Whip Artistry Studio. And please come back and um, have more look around the Bullwhip Museum and thank you again to Robert Dante and his crew for allowing us this time. Again, this is Jerry Deere with the Whip Artistry Studio. We'll see you out there in the Whip World.